It's okay. Our scripture today is from Acts chapter 2, starting with verse 40. And with many other words, and I apologize, uh, I'm just going right along here. Uh, last week, if you are interested in last week's sermon that I gave at 11, because I talked about something different at 8.30, then you can let me know. You can get it online, go to our church website, or if you want to copy, let me know, and I will make you a CD of last week's sermon. And we didn't even record it at 11, but I went back and regave it again and recorded it, so if anyone was interested. But it, we're sort of following through early acts here. The early, the start of the church, the beginning of the church. Last week was about Peter preaching repentance. And this week, it is about the early church. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them. <clears throat> so Peter had been preaching and the sermon that he gave, it wasn't all of it. That's just all that it told us in the Bible from Acts. But he had many other words too. So Peter preached a long time too. That was sort of a joke sometimes. And with many other words, he had a lot of words. He testified and exhorted them saying, be saved from this perverse generation. Michael's up there going, I'm trying to follow him here. I'm trying to follow him here. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together, and all had things in common and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. May God add his blessing to the reading, the hearing, the doing of his holy word. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. So Luke, who wrote Acts, Luke says that the disciples were doing these things. First, they were teaching the apostles' doctrine. That's what it said. They were teaching the apostles' doctrine. And, uh, and, in the, and the apostles' doctrine, it was all about Jesus. They were teaching Jesus. Someone told me yesterday, and they meant it as a compliment, not a complaint, that in my preaching I frequently talk about Jesus. They said, oh, he, he always talks about Jesus. And, it, and like I said, it wasn't a complaint. The, the doctrine, that's another way, young people, doctrine, that just means your belief system, what you believe. That's your doctrine, what we believe. That's the doctrine. So their doctrine was all about Jesus. They believed in Jesus. They knew about God before, before Jesus. All the Jewish people knew about God. You made sacrifices to God. God was angry. He was God of wrath. If you didn't do things right, sometimes people would get struck dead, and that still could happen uh, as we're going to talk about in a couple weeks with Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, but, but when they met Jesus, they knew God. Do you get that? They knew about God before, and, and, but when they met Jesus, they got to know God. And so they're going out teaching about Jesus, and they're teaching about God. Now, we have a tendency in our society just to say God, 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 and in general... Uh, in a general term, some people dilute who Jesus is and was. Uh, I, so I make my sermons up and give copies to uh, some different people, and, and they know how, uh, l how much stuff I got here. Let me see. Uh, I don't really need to say that. There was this church that... Uh, 
started a Jesus jar. You ever have a cuss jar at home? You ever heard of a cuss jar? Yeah. Okay, don't point fingers. <laughs> a cuss jar. Kids, what that is, if you don't know, sometimes, like, if someone's been in the, in the Marines or something, you, and they hang around people all the time who say bad words, sometimes you can start to say some words you shouldn't say yourself, right? And I'm not making excuses, but I'm saying, you know, my in-laws, since Diane isn't here, they're Catholic, and... There's a few bad words that, that my father-in-law just doesn't act like are bad words. They're not big bad words. They're little bad words. I mean little as in short. Anyhow, a cuss jar. I don't want to go too far down that road. Or it's If you say a bad word, you put a quarter in the jar or you put a dollar in the jar. Well, I know of churches who have Jesus jars so that they want to train, I mean big churches, they want to train all the staff not to just say God, 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 because God can mean a lot of things. To Jewish people, God means one thing. It doesn't mean Jesus. To Islam and, and Muslim people, God means Allah. It doesn't mean Jesus. So, so some Christian churches, just so there's no confusion, Jesus is God, and they say if you use God in a generic sense, you put money in the Jesus jar. They want people saying the name of Jesus. I mean, it's the name above all names, right? There's power in the name, right? So the disciples, the apostles' doctrine, they're teaching the apostles' doctrine, they're teaching about Jesus. That's what they're teaching about. <coughs> Excuse me. Fellowship. Number two. Fellowship. Fellowship. It says they were teaching the apostles' doctrine and they were in fellowship with one another. Fellowship, do you have, does it have to be active participation by people? It does. Active participation. I'm going to talk more in a couple weeks about active participation, but there's one thing here I want to be sure to to talk about. Maybe you've heard it before, maybe you haven't. Listen, it said that they sold things. Did you pick up on that? As other people had need, they sold stuff so that their friends wouldn't go without, so that their brothers and sisters wouldn't go without. They would sell things. It's not like socialism here. You weren't required to sell stuff. If, you know, if we had somebody in the church who didn't have a furnace and didn't have heat in their house. And you had some of those radiator, electric radiator heaters. You ever see those? Those are really nice. They put out a lot of heat. If we had somebody in the church who didn't have a furnace and, and we said to the church, listen, there's somebody who doesn't have a furnace. They're, they had an oil furnace and it went out and... I mean, really, we could fix it probably, but, but you might say, oh, I've got a couple of those radiator heaters in the basement that you plug in, and uh, I don't use them, so we'll give, you know, I'll give those to the person. I have heard of people who have had cars before, and the church has had something where they were going to help somebody, and, and someone has said, seriously, from Ginghamsburg, I, I remember a video about this, Guy had an old car, collector's car, sold it for $10,000 and gave all the money to the church to use for this project. He felt called to do it. Is everybody in the church required to do that? Is anybody in the church required to do that? No. But sometimes God just puts something on your heart and... It doesn't bother you to do it. I cheerfully do it. And I don't even want everybody else to know about it. Gosh, I, there's been some stuff here that people have given for... for we have a... Uh, I don't know whether to say... Oh, well. We have a friend who's a missionary in Haiti. And she is a long-term missionary. And she... 
you can't make money in Haiti. Everybody's trying to make money. She has to rely on the support of people back here. And Diane shared that with some people. And somebody wrote her a pretty large check to send to this girl who's a friend of ours in Haiti. Is everybody required to do that? No. That's what it was here. Don't get confused when you read this, when you hear this, that as people had need, they were selling stuff. It wasn't that you were required to do it. Sometimes you're just the one God calls to do something above and beyond. Right? You get what they're saying here? And so we're going to talk about, I mentioned in a few weeks, Ananias and Sapphira. They, they tried doing that, but they weren't really in, but they were wanting to appear that way before other people, and, and it didn't turn out good for them. Fellowship, active participation. We do things here. We feed the homeless. We uh, do the food pantry. Here's the thing you have to remember about the, this time. People were Jewish. When they converted to Christianity, when they became a follower of Jesus, it would be much like it is in the Muslim world today. If you're Muslim and you convert to Christianity, your family will try to kill you. you when you leave your family, you've got what? Nothing. That's what it was like here. When people would get baptized and, and come to Jesus, they're coming with nothing. They don't have family. They have nobody that cares about them. And so the church, there was this guy named Jason who his wife came to church and Jason didn't. And Jason was wanting to put up, I don't think I've told this story here, Jason was wanting to put up one of those big metal buildings. It's like corrugated. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Silver. He was, he was putting one of those up. Uh, outside his house. And Jason would go out to the bars and stuff, and his wife came to church, but Jason didn't. And so Jason was trying to put up one of those buildings, and he was wanting to do it on a Saturday when he was off work and he was home, and, and all his drinking buddies would always say, for three weeks in a row, they all said, yeah, we'll come Saturday and help you do it. And Jason would say, okay, let's, we'll start at 8 o'clock. And then, do you think they showed up? No, they didn't show up. So his wife, Bernadette, this is back at Sistersville where I went to church for a long time, 22 years, off and on. So his wife comes to the church and says, listen, I think this is an opportunity for you guys to prove yourself to Jason. This is an opportunity maybe to get him in church. And so she said, how many of you would be willing to come help Jason put up that building? And so we had a large number of people. I called off work that day. I called off work that day because I knew how important this was. And so about 10 of us went up, and by the end of the day, the women brought us food. The women from the church brought us food. I'll, I'll probably tear up just telling this story. It was such an awesome day. The church going out and putting up this building, and the women participating, and everybody. I mean, I've still got a scar on my hand right here, on my wrist, from where one of those metal things fell, and they're sharp, and I tried to catch it, and it cut two big gashes out of my wrist right here, and I've still got that, and I'm happy I've got that. I wasn't happy at the time it happened, but now I look at that, and I think of that day all the time, about being in fellowship, and how that draws people into the church if we're willing to. And so, lo and behold, uh, Jason started coming to church because he found out we weren't all weird. Some of us were, but we weren't all. And so he started coming to church. He became a believer. And he, he's, he makes these crosses now and sells them for different projects. I mean, it's awesome. Fellowship. And when we talk about fellowship and active participation in the church, I love this. I heard one pastor ask these three questions to the congregation. 
If everyone, I'm talking about fellowship, active participation in the church, if everyone in the church was like you, what kind of church would we have? Is that a good question? If everybody in the church attended the same amount you attended, if everybody in the church came to the same amount of stuff that you come to, if everybody in the church put the same, gave the same percent that you gave, if everybody uh, did the same amount of work in the church that you do, if everybody represented Jesus out in the world the same as you do, what kind of church would we have? If you left, could you slip three questions? That was one. If you left, could you slip out and nobody would really notice? If you left the church, would anybody really notice? And you say, well, they should. Well, if you're not active and participating, and, you know, if I said to Michael, I thought about him this week as I was preparing this sermon, if Michael doesn't show up one Sunday morning, is, am I going to notice? Yeah, hey, where's Michael? Oh, man, we need somebody to run the projector. You're going to have to get your hymnals out. and You're going to get so used to not getting the hymnals out that if everybody was... Okay, so third, is it possible that if you left it would help the church? This was three questions the pastor asked. Is it possible that if you left it would help the church? That's, a, that's funny, but it's not funny. And this pastor, it was at a mega church, and he said, some of you are having affairs right now. Now, probably nobody here is, but some of you are having affairs, and, and if you get a church of 10,000 people, you know there's people sitting out there who are having affairs, right? He said, some of you are having affairs right now and people know you go to church. And, and someone may say, oh man, so and so, they're, they're going to that church and they're sleeping with my wife. See? Would, would it help the church if that person would leave the church? Yeah! You're giving Jesus a bad name! Would it help the church if you left? I loved playing baseball as a kid. And there was this one time... I know I'm, I'm still on fellowship. We got communion and prayer. There was this one time that I remember, I was like eight or nine years old, and we were all legends in our own mind when we were kids, right? In sports, we're legends in our own minds. I remember this one time, I was eight or nine years old, and I was late getting to the baseball game. And I played shortstop, I could really hit at eight years old, and I remember, this is true, and I'm not bragging, I'm just saying, when I got there, and I was just right before the game started, and the other kids, they thought I wasn't coming. And I got there, and I pulled in, and I got out of the car, and I swear to you, I don't remember a lot from eight years old, but I remember the team cheering because I was there. Yay! <laughs> and then I got to be 13 or 14, and I wasn't a very good baseball player. And as a matter of fact, they didn't care if I came or not. Matter of fact, the coach probably liked it if I didn't come because then he didn't have to worry about trying to get me into the game. You know what I'm saying? And I'm not saying that our job in the church is based on performance, but I'm saying, does it even matter if we're there or not? Is it furthering the kingdom of God? Are we part of the fellowship, part of the work of the church? Or does it even matter if we're here? And you don't have to be running the projector and you don't have to be here. There was this lady named Alberta Percival. She was at the Mason Church, 94 years old. And if I were going to an emergency, say I got a call and I rush out the door and I'm on my way to an emergency, sometimes if it was re something really bad, I would call Alberta. And I would say, Alberta, I'm going to so-and-so's house so-and-so just had a heart attack, would you pray? And she would say, yes, I will. And I would know that that 94-year-old woman would be on her knees in prayer. And so, so much so that when she died, there was a void. And it wasn't anything anybody in the church knew. It wasn't anything she did. 
did in the church, you see where I'm going with this? You can be an asset to the church. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're playing the organ or playing the piano or run the projector or preaching or taking up the offering. You can be missed because of your prayer life. So I don't want you to think that it's based on your performance here at the church or what you do here at the church. Being part of the fellowship. Alberta was a vital part of the fellowship. Breaking bread communion. When At this time, it says that they were teaching the apostle doctrine, so they were teaching all about what? They were teaching all about Jesus. Second, they were getting together in fellowship, helping each other out as they need. Third, they were in communion together. In the beginning, at this time, what most people believe is that they were probably just in houses sharing meals. It wasn't like we think of communion, you know, last time we had communion, Gage and Sean at 11 o'clock church uh, served communion. We have the little cup of juice, we have a little piece of bread, and that's communion for us. That's not what they're talking about here. They're talking about meals together. That's communion. And that's also fellowship. It wasn't until sometime down the road that the church came up with this idea that when we gather together, we'll have a little cup of juice and a little piece of bread. That wasn't what they did at the time. It was meals together. If you want to know what communion was like back then, you come to a Wednesday night dinner. That's what communion was like back then. It was rejoicing in Jesus. Little, maybe little talk about Jesus like we do on Wednesday nights. Prayer, thanking God for this food. Some, some commentaries say that some of the poorer people who were Christians, that that was their primary sustenance. That that was their primary meal because they had nothing else, so they would gather for meals. Can you imagine if they came for communion and back then and they said, okay, I've got this little cup of juice and this little piece of wafer for you. <laughs> Here, eat and be satisfied. I don't... So Wednesday night dinners, that's more like what communion was, what they're talking about here. Joining in fellowship, joining in praising the Lord, joining in a meal, and then fourth, prayer. Man, too often... I, listen, if you pray an hour a day, God bless you. I mean, just sit down one solid hour and pray. M most people don't do that. And, and if we're being honest, most of the time, we'll throw in the obligatory, oh, God, you're so great, but most of the time, what is our prayer? It's a wish list. God, save my sister-in-law. God, draw my sons closer to you. God, heal this person. God, right? That's mostly what our prayers are like. Back in Mason, we, I thought we were supposed to build a gymnasium, and I thought we were supposed to buy a bowling alley. Well, at the gymnasium part, we had bought a piece of property, near the church, paid it off in eight months, and then I did what you're supposed to do, I guess. I put it out to a vote in the church. We put it in the bulletin. I said, two weeks ahead, I said, do, do me a favor. The next two weeks, be in prayer about whether we're supposed to build a gymnasium or not. So be in prayer about whether we're supposed to build a gymnasium or not. So we, two weeks later, I put these forms in the bulletin, I send them out, and they come back, and we got a huge response. 98% of the people said, yes, we're supposed to build a gymnasium. We got about 100 forms, papers back in. Two people said, no. Of the 
that we got back that said yes, half of them said, because the options were, are we supposed to do it and are we supposed to do it now or save money? Of the 98 that we got back that said, yes, we're supposed to build a gymnasium, half said now, half said later. So I said, okay, that's not good enough. But then on a Wednesday night dinner with the people who had filled out those papers who I had said, tell me, or I mean pray the next two weeks, I said, I want to show a hands tonight. How many of you, this is just how I, uh, sometimes I'm very, no malarkey. How many of you prayed about this decision? And there were about 60 people there for dinner. And two people raised their hands. Two people prayed about it. What did the others do? Well, they already knew how they felt about it. You ever get your mind changed through prayer? You ever pray, God, I wish you would change so-and-so's heart? And then all of a sudden you're going, oh, oh, you want to change my heart. <laughs> you ever do that? They were gathered in prayer. How else do you go out and tell people who killed Jesus, you killed him, you need to repent. How do you do that if you don't pray? You've got to pray, don't you? Because they just might kill you. But through prayer, you say, okay, God, if that's what you want me to tell them, I'll tell them. And then you go and you tell them, you killed Jesus and you need to repent. You need to go back to that very same Jesus. We need to pray. And, and not pray as in ask God for things. Although sometimes, you know what I pray all the time? God, I pray you'd give me vision and wisdom for this church. I pray that all through the day. God, I pray you'd give me vision and wisdom for this church. I pray it all the time. Vision and wisdom. Vision, where, where do you want us to go And wisdom? Is it my will or is it your will? Paul says pray without ceasing. I mean, you're obviously not going to come to the altar all day and pray because you're not out making disciples or you're not out witnessing. You're not out being the hands and feet. But you can still pray all day. So four things they were doing, and, I'm, and this is it. They were, one, teaching the apostles' doctrine, which was teaching about Jesus. They were teaching and talking about Jesus. They were joining in fellowship in, church, in the church, probably, where, the temple at that time, they were still going to the temple, and in homes, teaching about Jesus at home, gathering neighbors for a picnic, and then slipping Jesus in. The old bait and switch, right? Communion together, eating meals together, and... I wanted to talk about unity too, but that's going to have to wait. I will just say this about unity. Um, the, lay, the lay ministry team, or I don't know what it's called, nomination team, we're going to be getting together soon and praying about deciding who to ask to be church leaders for the next year. Some people are going off committees, new people becoming on committees, and we need to have some unity in the leadership of the church. And are we going to agree on everything? No. Do I want a bunch of yes people on there? No. But I want people who have a vision of proclaiming Jesus to the neighborhood and the world. The mission of Jesus. Opening the doors of the church on behalf of Jesus. Oh, let me tell you this. November 2nd, we're hosting the soccer team from Franklin High School here at the church for their awards banquet. We're fixing them dinner, and they're going to have their awards banquet here November 2nd in the church. Is that awesome? Yes. If you don't think that's awesome, you shouldn't be on the leadership of the church. So quite frankly. We're hosting the football team. Did you know this? 
Oh, that's a secret. Don't tell anybody. Homecoming week. The football team's coming here, and I'm going to do a little devotion with them. We're going to have a sp uh, spaghetti dinner, and the coach is going to come and talk to them some right here in the fellowship hall. Is that awesome? If you don't think that's awesome, you probably shouldn't be on the leadership of this church. Fellowship. Man, would Jesus be pleased that the football team was coming here? Yes, He would. He would love it. He's going to love it. Okay, let me... Jesus, overall, fellowship, communion, and prayer. And communion meaning more than the juice and the little piece of bread. That was... And then, people, but when the church does that, people are saved every day. That's what it said in the Bible. When the church does that, people are saved. God added to their numbers daily. Is the church saving people? No. God's adding to the numbers every day. If you're out doing those things, if I'm out doing those things. Let me pray. God, we thank you for this example of what the church is supposed to be like. Jesus, proclaiming Jesus above all. Fellowship amongst ourselves and taking that fellowship out the doors with us. Gathering for common meals and prayer. And that will bring us unity. So we give you thanks for this example of the church and I pray, God, that you would help us to grab on to that and that you would add, that you would save people every day and add to this local congregation. God, for those who are here today and don't feel like that they have been a part of the church or that they're not a part of the church, God, I pray that you would help them see how they can work for your glory to fit in to the fellowship of this church. And maybe that's starting a new ministry or maybe it's getting into a ministry that's already established. God, I just thank you and praise you for all of this in Christ's name. Amen.